You know, that's always the cue. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Fred Kellum. I'm the interim director at SSD. And uh, as probably all of you know, I have a very large pair of shoes to fill, that of Stuart Siegel, who you probably recall has been uh, the introducer for this event for many, many years. So this is my first time at it, and uh, Stuart has retired, if you didn't know, and of course we all wish him well. Uh, it's a real privilege for me to be here tonight and uh, to introduce, make some opening remarks about the sixth annual uh, Speak Able. And this is something that really has been the brainchild and uh, the hard work of the Student uh, Advisory Board for six years now. This is the sixth time we've gotten together. It's really a remarkable event in my view. Uh, I think you're going to hear some very poignant uh, presentations and also some videos from uh, uh, students that decided to, to have their presentation in that way. So I think at the first thing I'd like to do is recognize uh, the students on the advisory board. Our, everyone here, I want them to stand up so we can all embarrass them and give them a hand. Where are they? <laughs> really hard work they've done. And I, and I want to identify someone, too, who's done a lot of, lot of work that I've seen directly to make this happen. And that is Megan uh, Marshall in the back. And a little side anecdote <laughs> is that, uh, and I learned this from Stuart, last year apparently Megan was instrumental in making sure that we had Zingerman's cater tonight. <laughs> the problem was that I learned after the fact is that the food ran out. So Megan was instrumental this year in making sure that we had more Zingerman's food <laughs> and that that wouldn't occur. Okay, so. Now, before we begin, um, I didn't have any prepared remarks, but I've been thinking about this kind of in a free, open form as I walked over here today, and I found myself being kind of influenced by my history as a dynamic psychologist. Not surprising, <laughs> because that has been my long history. And I thought it would be unfair simply to present this as individuals sharing poignant and important aspects of their life, which it is, but it seems to me so much more than that. What happens when a person publicly talks about very important things that may have existed primarily just as thoughts, ideas, a way of understanding themselves, internal narratives, decides to share those, and they hear themselves describe that aspect of what previously might just have been an inner world. And courageously, I think, do it in front of all of you. It seems such a courageous act to me. I was thinking about it, how brave it is to be willing to do that, how important it is, and how cathartic that must be for anyone doing that, how strong their motives must be, uh, how important that is for them, and how meaningful that is to decide to do that. It's not just giving a talk. It seems to me it's a major psychological decision, right? And what of the people out there, all of you? I don't think it's just sound waves coming into the ear. That's what a, bio a biological psychologist would say. They're wrong. <laughs> you get a chance to hear aspects of the world from a different perspective. And implicitly or explicitly, you get to map that onto your sense of the world and what your experience is and how that is different and how that informs your understanding of who you are and certainly helps you understand the person that's presenting in front of you. And there's that dualistic, interactional kind of sense of increased understanding and insight. That's what I think this is this evening, okay? And that seems to me many clicks above just the idea of someone presenting and people listening. It's a really dynamic event when you think about it. 
So that's what a dynamic psychologist thinks about when he walks across the diag. <laughs> so I hope everyone uh, here really uh, enjoys and is impressed by um, what uh, some students are going to uh, be willing to do here tonight in terms of their presentation. And uh, I uh, thank you for allowing me to make some introductory remarks here. Thank you. Have a good night. Hello. I don't remember if I have a slide. I don't, but that's okay. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Jeff Edelstein. I am a recent uh, graduate of the master's program in higher education here at the University of Michigan. I've been here since fall 2017 and greatly enjoyed my time here away from the warm, warm South Floridian climate uh, for the most part. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna give a short physical description, as we'll be doing for many of our presenters, for folks who are blind or, uh, or low vision in our audience. So I am 5'10"-ish. Uh, I have brown hair. I have a beard. I've combed my hair. Uh, I'm wearing a blue sweater vest, sweater, sweater, uh, with tan slacks and black shoes, and a tie that is partially visible at the top of my sweater, uh, and a beard. Did I say a beard? I have a beard. Okay, I have a beard. Uh, so anyway, I'll be emceeing the event, which means I am just the incidental music in between our wonderful acts of students. Um, in case you can't tell, I was in theater at some point. Uh, so we'll be starting off uh, with a introduction for our first speaker, uh, Ali Darwick. Uh, again, we have physical descriptions and intros for each person. Uh, and then we'll leave them to their presentations. Uh, Ali, Ali is a bio, biomolecular science major, a chess and soccer player, and he's a sophomore, so be around for a while. Uh, physical description that has been provided is 5'8", uh, Arab American, Lebanese comb over, two inches comb to his left, black <laughs> pants, button up, gray button up sweater. I appreciate the detail. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to invite him onto the stage and we'll get started with our first presentation. Good evening, everybody. Wonderful weather we're having. While it's not exactly summer yet, this weather is far more preferable than the polar vortex weather that we had about two months ago. I think we can all agree. However, this man in this slide, as well as me, both enjoyed the polar vortex weather. And the reason why I enjoyed this polar vortex weather is because it was negative 45 degrees. And that allowed me to open up my windows and let the cold air flood my room. Of course, I did all this while having fans surrounding me and don't worry, I mean physical fans, I'm not a celebrity or anything. <laughs> and I had an ice pack on my neck. Now, if you think that I was hot, you would be wrong. However, if you somehow predicted that I have hyperhidrosis, which causes me to sweat excessively for no apparent reason, you made an excellent prediction. Hyperhidrosis, which I will call HH, is a condition that I will focus on today, and I will tell you how it impacts me, as well as why such a condition should never be undermined. HH is a rather downplayed and not talked about disability, and it affects millions of people like myself. Anyone can downplay this disability. I mean, even Dr. Phil did it. On his show, a lady went up who had hyperhidrosis, and she was seeking some treatments. Uh, Dr. Phil got a, derm a dermatologist to the show in order to suggest some treatments. While the dermatologist was proposing some of his treatments, uh, the... Dr. Phil proceeded to interrupt the dermatologist, and he said that there is something that we all have in ourselves that is negative, that we don't like. Now, the thing is with, with hyperhidrosis, it's not something that we just don't like. It's something that impacts every facet of our, of our lives, and it transcends the bounds of, it transcends the realm of uh, physicality and affects us on a mental level as well. It manifests in various forms as well under the arms, palmer, and plantar are the most common. 
but there are yet others. So how did we evolve the ability to sweat? As you can see in this slide is a man who is sweating. And uh, basically, the ability to sweat is an advantageous mutation. <coughs> Sorry, just have to blow my nose. Uh, the ability to sweat was an advantageous one, and that's why, if any of you guys have taken evol evolutionary biology or anything, an advantageous mutation remains with us. And uh, so the ability to sweat began hundreds of thousands of years ago, all the way to two million years ago. And part of our brain, the hypothalamus, which modulates our body temperature, has receptors. And after these receptors are triggered, that allows us to have a physiological uh, uh, change, which uh, causes the dilation of blood vessels. And after the blood vessels dilate, that results in the secretion of sweat. And then that results in, in an evaporation process. And as you all may know, evaporation leads to a cooling process. Uh, so while many of you guys may think, what's the big deal with sweating uh, more than the average person, how can you be so ungrateful? They are not seeing something vital. This disability, as it is classified, is debilitating, to say the least. As I said before, it transcends the bounds of being, being a physical disability and affects those who have it mentally as well. It controlled many of my decisions. Decisions as simple as, should I play chess? So I love playing chess, but as you all may know, it's customary to, to shake a hand before playing chess. In this picture um, is Magnus Carlsen, the reigning world chess champion. On the left is Vichy Anand, the previous reigning world champion. Uh, Magnus clearly won uh, this match. And um, so it's customary to shake hands. So I didn't want to play chess for that reason, even though there's an international master at the University of Michigan, which is really great. Um, anyways, uh, should I apply for a research position, I asked myself. Well, no, because that entails going through an interview process, and interviews involve giving a firm handshake, which is not really cool, right? Not for someone like me. So finally, decisions within my community as well. As an Arab American, shaking hands about 50 times is not abnormal. We, we shake hands left and right, like every minute or so, and it's customary to do this. So what I would have to do in case I did want to hang out with any of my friends is I would make sure to leave last. Because if I did not leave last, then I, I would have to shake everyone's hand who still sits uh, and remains. So leaving last gives me the advantage of only shaking the, the host's hand, and uh, that would give me enough time to prepare to shake the hand. And worst of all, I can't unlock my phone because you know the touch screen doesn't really detect it. So is there a solution? For uh, hyperhidrosis, fortunately, HH can be fought against. Botox injections are one of the proposed uh, solutions. And as the name suggests, you get shots in your hand or wherever uh, you need the treatment to be done. It's an expensive procedure, and it lasts for only several months. So it's not the best. Uh, there are other side effects uh, that consist of numbing, et cetera. Another treatment is endoscopic thoracic sympathectomy, ETS which is a fancy name for you're going to get a nerve cut in your chest. And this nerve basically uh, controls the amount of sweating in the extremities. Uh, this does have a really big downfall. While it does reduce the sweating in the extremities, it may lead to sweating in other places, uh, so-called compensatory sweating. Um, so that might not be ideal. And it's expensive as well. Medicine is another uh, proposed uh, solution that I tried. A uh, dermatologist prescribed rubinol for me, which had side effects that ranged from dryness of uh, different parts of the, your body everywhere except the extremities for me, unfortunately. And um, it did not work, and it also increases your heart rate by a lot. So I stumbled upon another solution after extensive research called iontophoresis. As you can see in this slide, uh, which is not really clear, I'm sorry, um, is a person who's submerging his or her hands in uh, some kind of pans uh, attached to some kind of battery by alligator clips with water, of course. And basically, uh, they discovered a while ago that electrical currents supposedly suppress the sweat from uh, steeping out through the skin somehow. It's not really understood why. After I read that 95% of the people see positive results, I was elated. Of course, that was prior to me seeing that it cost $1,000. 
Even worse, they didn't sell this machine in the United States. So what was I going to do? I did extensive research on, on iontophoresis and found out that I could make my own machine at home. And of course, it's not as aesthetic, but it got the job done. So I went to different stores and bought the uh, ingredients to make this machine. So after a few hours of searching around and $36 later, I bought a 12-volt battery, alligator clips, and aluminum trays. In this image, you can see um, there's uh, aluminum, uh, aluminum trays and some tap water. Also, I needed some alligator clips to attach this uh, so I can get the electrical current to flow from the battery to the aluminum trays. So this is the exact battery that I use at home, which is 12 volts and uh, some alligator clips. So basically what you do is you submerge your hands in, this, uh, in the water uh, and aluminum uh, foil <laughs> for about 20 minutes. Then you have to switch the polarity every 20 minutes so uh, if you ensure you get both hands. Uh, I must say that there are dangers to doing this. Uh, this is my setup, an actual one from my house. You can see a picture of me. or uh, It's not really clear. <laughs> um, I also have a voltmeter. So I have to make sure the battery is not uh, didn't run out. So this is I get to use this remote. So this is the voltmeter, and uh, I just make sure that uh, I still have 12 volts. I also sometimes add salt so I can increase the conductivity, and sometimes I got a little fancy and put pennies because pennies have copper, and copper is a really good conductor of electricity. So there's many things you have to do, but you must ensure that the pans don't touch because if the pans touch. That wouldn't be really fun because that, that causes a short circuit, which causes a lot of voltages to, uh, to seep out through the, through the battery, and that could prove fatal. So, yeah. Um, you would be surprised, however, to hear that there are benefits to having hyperhidrosis. For example, I never, I never have to uh, worry about buying lotion. <laughs> and that's about it. <laughs> Finally, a conversation with a professor. Um, I had proved to be life-changing. Recently, I spoke with a professor about having accommodations for taking exams while having this disability. And uh, he was really cool about it, and he told me that it's fine. Um, I can get the accommodations required. Then, later on, uh, the next day, I went to office hours for a completely another purpose, to ask questions about an upcoming exam. And then, he some, for some reason, he mentioned uh, the email. He goes like, Ali, why do you need accommodations? And I didn't really know how to answer this question because no one has ever asked me such a personal question. But I decided to be honest. He knew that I wanted to be a doctor because many people in the class were aspiring physicians. And he told me, you know, med schools will see that you have a disability. And this will put you at a disadvantage. They don't want a doctor who's disabled. Not only was I an immigrant who lacked support, help, and guidance, I now had another battle to face a disability that I thought would affect my chances of getting into medical school. If I were to tell you this didn't hurt me, I'd be lying. It hurt a lot. But I kept thinking and thinking about the situation and came to a conclusion. If a med school is so shallow as to not accept a student for his disability, then I don't deserve to go to that medical school, one that is so discriminatory. In fact, I, like many others, have lifelong ch who have lifelong challenges that make up our, our identities will be the best doctors ever, doctors with empathy, an empathy that is unparalleled. We will know how to take care of patients because we have been patients for a long time. Unless you have a given disability, you cannot truly understand what it's like to live with one. I have learned to cope with HH, making it part of who I am. Imam Ali, the cousin of Prophet Muhammad, and the man I was named after once said, our cure is surely within us, but we perceive it not. HH is no exception. Today, I am not afraid to play chess at the University of Michigan. I am not afraid to apply to any position that requires a firm handshake. And I am not afraid of hanging out with my friends who shake hands 50 times. Lastly, I used to say that I suffer from hyperhidrosis. Today, I simply say that I have hyperhidrosis. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ali. 
next person up is actually a person I actually know. Uh, not that I don't know Nali, I know him now, as we all know each other, <laughs> which is the point of this event. Um, anyway, uh, so our next person who's coming up to speak is Noah Cohen. Uh, Noah is a first year dental student here at the University of Michigan, uh, and he is two years and 10 months clean, uh, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> I'll also vouch that he's a great Fortnite player, but that's just roommate stuff. So uh, so Noah's physical description that he has provided is he's 5'11", white, Jewish, with short curly hair. Um, and I'll let him take away the rest. Hello, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my name is Noah. Um, and I'm an addict in recovery. Um, I didn't write a speech because I decided to do this yesterday. <laughs> um, but I wrote a little poem last night to kind of get things started. Uh, this one goes out to everyone who always asks me if I want to drink at parties. <clears throat> hey, you want to drink? Nah, thanks, man. I'm good. Why not? I don't drink. Why? Well, if you really must know, when I take a drink, everything changes. The way I think starts to become dangerous, obsessive, compulsive. I need another one. 3 AM drinking out of empty cups, people left behind, but I'm still here. The party died, and something inside me dies too. Everything I once knew, everything I once was starts to disappear. My family, my friends, the idea of who I am, my world shrinks so small that no one else can fit. Call it selfish, but it's more like survival. Constantly looking for a fix like it's a meal and I'm starving, lying to whoever, whoever still believes me, stealing from whoever still trusts me, hurting everyone who ever loved me. Something feels broken because everything becomes hopeless. It's all in the pursuit of this high that gets shorter and less pleasing until it's this desperate pursuit of this numbness that gets some amount of relief, but it's fleeting until it just doesn't work. And all I have left is the life I've destroyed and the shell of my emaciated body whose soul has been void since I took that drink. It always comes down to one choice, either get clean or die. Thank God I'm alive. So uh, <clears throat> that was a little heavy, I, I know that. Uh, and, and the reason that I kind of wanted to write about what active addiction was like is because most people never really experience it. Um, they kind of see it. I mean, a lot of people know drug addicts or alcoholics, um, and it's pretty prevalent. Um, but to be in it is something that's uh, very difficult to describe. Um, and I guess what I mostly want to focus on today is, is talking about recovery. Um, so the, I guess like to define addiction, um, there. I, I do this 12-step program, and that's how I've been able to stay clean. Uh, it's called Narcotics Anonymous, and it's like Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and in the, in the book, they describe addiction as having three um, portions. There's like the physical, which is like the, compuls the compulsion to use. And there's the mental, which is like the obsession. And then there's the spiritual portion, which is like the self-centeredness. And basically, addiction is sort of like an all-encompassing disease that sort of takes over uh, your entire life. Um, and so I guess I'll just kind of talk about my story. Um, you know, I tried to get clean a few times. Uh, and it's, it's difficult being my age, I guess, um, just because of, like, the culture, uh, <laughs> being in college and, you know, people partying and stuff. But... I don't know, I kind of use that as an excuse because there are people much younger than me who got clean. Like, the truth is I just wasn't really ready yet. Um, and it's like a difficult topic because um, there's nothing you can really do to help a loved one that's, that's suffering from this if they're not ready to get help. Um, and people ask me that all the time, like, can I help this person? Can I, can I fix them? Can I get them clean? And like, I can't, and, and nobody really can, uh, and that's what's really sad about this. Like, for me, like, I got to that point where I kind of described it, where, like, my last choice was, like, suicide, 
And my, my parents, my family, my friends, they've been telling me, you know, I have a problem <laughs> since high school. And I, I kind of knew it, but uh, I didn't think there was any way out. Um, so when I got clean, I sort of had to leave everything behind. Um, you, you sort of a attain these like delusional thoughts when you're using. And that's part of what early recovery and even now recovery is about is kind of like identifying those thoughts and like telling the truth to them so they don't control you. Um, so a couple of my delusional thoughts, I guess, was that I, I needed to be high to function. Um, I needed to be high to feel okay or to be myself or to be in public or to wake up or to study or take a test or you know pretty much do anything. Um, and so the only way to really prove that that's false is to try. And it's terrifying <laughs> to try. Um, but I, get, I got a lot of hope from the people in the meetings. Um, you know, they're, I identified with them. The, you know, the stories that they said, I, we used different drugs for different amounts of time. We ended up at different places. But like the feelings that they shared of desperation and like utter despair and like destruction, like losing themselves completely. Um, I identified with that so deeply that it was like undeniable. It's like if if you if if someone has been where I've been and they have a smile on their face, like I'm gonna stay with them until I figure out how to smile myself. And and that's what recovery is sort of about. Um, you get a sponsor. Uh, you go to meetings every single day. Um, it's pretty <laughs> intense because you know I was getting high ten times a day, like. It, it was a life-altering thing to get clean. And uh, when, I, when I came back to school, I was actually an undergrad at uh, Michigan State. And they, that was when I first was introduced to like collegiate recovery. Um, and that was just amazing, to see people even more like me, even, even more similar to me, who were going through classes, you know, like the stress of the teachers giving them <laughs> homework assignments and kind of not treating them nicely and still being able to like not get high. Um, they had my stresses and you know um, I can relate with kind of what you were saying about like the stigma um, you know applying to dental school. Um, a ton of people told me like do not tell anybody you're a drug addict. That is pretty much the worst thing <laughs> you can tell them <laughs> and like deep inside me I'm like you're wrong like I know what I am like this is the most powerful message I have like um, but what I had to realize is that like nobody like a very small amount of people know what addiction really is and even less know what recovery really is um, so <laughs> I ended up not telling the full truth um, to get in to U of M dental school and you know I guess here I am on stage at U of M Telling the full truth, so don't uh, don't kick me out. <laughs> um, but yeah, a little bit about like recovery. Uh, you know, when I was when I was using, I my life had sort of degraded to the point of like being in my basement and getting high, going outside to smoke a cigarette, and then coming back. It was like this like obsessive, repetitive. Like I didn't text any friends, call any friends. I didn't have anybody, um, and that was not all their fault. I mean, I didn't pick up the phone at all because, like, I didn't believe anyone could help me. Um, there's, like, this hopelessness that's, like, this thing's so powerful. How could anybody stand a chance? Um, and, you know, like, I slowly started to rebuild my life with the help of a ton of people. Um, like, I learned what it, what it means to actually be a friend. <laughs> Um, because when I was using, like, friends were just people that that meant you didn't have to get high by yourself. Friends were someone you could kind of, like, eh, pull one over on, you know, um, use people. I, you know, I used people in my addiction. And in, in recovery, like, that selfishness is, like, is, like, it's not absent whatsoever, but it's much less. 
like I'm, I am here um, not just like for myself, like I've been saved, you know, um, for a reason, like for a purpose. And uh, I guess like learning how to deal with emotions, that's, that's one good thing. I, I'm kind of going on tangents, but learning how to deal with emotions, like recovery forces you to learn how to deal with feelings. Because if you don't, you end up getting high. Um, so like, yeah, I've been uh, forced to learn like, oh, what's that feeling called? Why did it happen? You know, talk about it with someone. I can't just hide it inside me because I might not get high immediately, but like all my addiction will manifest in other ways. Um, and it's, it's uh, not fun. Um, but like recovery has sort of been a process of uncovering like who I am, like who I was before uh, addiction destroyed, ooh, red. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm trying to wrap it up with something real nice. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm just, I'm just glad that uh, I got the opportunity to come, come here and speak. So thank you guys. And thank you, Noah. If you liked his poem, I also vouch for his music skills. They're quite good. Uh, so the next two presentations that we're going to have, um, and a quick reminder to any of you texting friends at home, we are Facebook living this event. So I'm just going to give them a quick wave. Uh, so these two videos are for two member or two individuals who wanted to present here um, and wanted to pre-record their videos. Uh, one of them, Brad Evenho, is not here uh, right now, but uh, I'll be giving him an introduction and a description as I've done with other uh, presenters, and then we'll show the video, which is about eight minutes long. Uh, I made the videos or edited them, so if you have any issues with the videos, please let me know. I appreciate constructive feedback. Um, so. Uh, Brad is a senior in BGS, which is a multidisciplinary degree in uh, the literature, sciences, and the arts. Uh, he is heavily, to say it lightly, involved with the disability community on campus. He has been a volunteer for engineering professor David Chesney's Gaming for the Greater Good class. He's involved with the group uh, with me called Disability Culture at UM. He is a member of the SSD Student Advisory Board and the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Advisory Boards and a bunch of other groups too numerous to name. Uh, physical description, quick little things. Uh, Brad is uh, white, he wears glasses, he uses an electric wheelchair, and he has short brown hair. He may be wearing a hat, he wears a lot of University of Michigan gear. Uh, go blue. Uh, so anyway, just give me one moment and we'll have the video up and running. I am Brad Ethan Holt, a student with a physical disability, a visual disability, and a vocal disability. I'm here to talk to you today about the rustic time of the disabled, something which I have written much about in the past. When many people come across the rustic time of the disabled, one of the first few questions are what is 
I then said to her, learn what and what is people for learn what I hear to tell you that I then perceive her if were you could make an answer and make person disability rather than people which is one you put the emphasis on that person being a person for God they differ between I F L and P F L R they differ between Calling someone a disabled person, which is I F L, or a person which is a person who has a just the ability for with it to There are a number of things you said in should not say to a person with a disability. You should first find the time to ask a <coughs> person with a what they would prefer <coughs> IFL or PFL. I prefer PFL <coughs> because I do not wish anyone to think of me as a person for and that is just me. I know those of people that prefer identity for Something that I have found through many sources to be not what <coughs> you want to say to a person with a 
Thank you, Brad. Uh, so as he said at the end, and as the final uh, slide showed, or frame, <laughs> if you want to read the story to which Brad is referring, uh, search Bradley Evenhoe on medium.com, and it should pop up. Going to transition back to this. Okay. Uh, so our next video is of Kayla Williams. Uh, Kayla is, pulling up descriptions on my phone, uh, a senior in the School of Information. She's involved with disability advocacy and technology-related organizations. She's a residential advisor, or RA, and a software developer at the Shapiro Design Lab in the undergraduate library. Uh, her physical description reads as follows, five a foot one, African-American or black, long braids with silver beads. She's wearing a Michigan shirt, black leggings, and gym shoes. She's actually here if she wants to say hi to people. She's here to support the cause, which we appreciate. Uh, so I'm going to play her video, um, and I encourage folks to chat with Kayla later. Hi, my name is Kayla Williams. When you see me, you see a black female. Some of you may wonder, why are you even here? Do you have any experience with disability? Because you're standing up, you're talking clearly, <coughs> you see you have good vision, so why are you even here? If you haven't caught on yet, I'm deaf. Deaf? Yeah, you heard it right. I'm deaf. That is having a visible disability, which means that you can't see it. But I do have similar experiences with those who do have visible disabilities. I knew that transitioning into college, it would be a different experience. I was prepared and told stories of what it's like to be on campus. But that was just from a black person perspective. I wasn't prepared for this climate that would exist for a deaf person. I was not prepared for that. The lack of support from some staff and <coughs> students and faculty has increased my level of stress. Ironically, I'm already stressed as a student. I was born with a profound to severe hearing loss in both ears. I didn't have an accident, nothing tragic happened, nothing bizarre, just simply born that way. It is true that my disability is not physical, but it is invisible. It actually makes it harder for people to believe me when I say that I'm deaf. This lack of knowledge about disability and deafness has been a leading factor in my supportive process. Yes, it is true that I could talk clearly without a deaf accent. Yes, I can hear with the help of a cochlear implant. It's simply just a hearing device that restores hearing as the prosthetic hearing. But oftentimes, people fail to realize that I do not have a similar hearing as if just like you guys who were born with hearing. People fail to realize that I actually need accommodations to help assist me in engaging these conversations, from lip reading to observing your behavioral language, your emotions, how you're feeling, 
um, context clues. I use all of those to engage what's happening in the conversation. But in reality, I have to use these tools because I can only hear 20% of the conversation if I'm lucky. So that ranges from a mix of sounds to maybe a few words I heard out of that sentence. Because of this lack of awareness, I often have to explain my deafness to others and how I have to deal with that. I have to advocate on a regular basis. Sometimes I get positive results, sometimes I don't. But this is the reality of my life. I have to advocate for myself and I always have done so since I was a child. I have to decide based on the scenario when to mask my deafness and when I am comfortable enough to share it in that particular situation. I recall many times when <laughs> professors refused to accommodate me because they assumed that I didn't need it because of my clarity in my speech, or they just simply didn't want to because of their lack of knowledge and awareness about deafness. I asked that I get to sit in the front row. There's a seat reserved for me on the far right because my hearing is technically on my left side. I asked that they wear a microphone which caters to me and connects directly to my cochlear. I recall times when students treated me differently because I asked for certain accommodations. I simply asked that you look at me in the face so I can read your lips. I asked that you go cover your mouth so I can read your lips. I asked that when we have group meetings to meet in a quiet environment, limiting all of the background noises to make it easier for me to understand the conversation. I recall many times when my note takers didn't come to class or I type really crappy notes to the point where I'm still clueless for the day, what happened that lecture. I recall so many times to this day where people speak to me extremely loudly and extremely slow, and it comes off as an insult to my intelligence. But they fail to realize that I just simply cannot hear. Professors were furious when I asked for a simple accommodation of closed captioning for videos that are shown in class. And I recall a time when I lived in a dorm for two years without the proper fine line, meaning that I need a strobe light because when I take off the cochlear implant, I am deaf and I no longer hear things. So I need that strobe light to assist me. I still remember to this day when I got that email, I felt help helpless, angry, and so disappointed as if my life didn't even matter. This was a long lasting battle for me, but it wasn't the beginning or the end of many challenges. This was just one of the many obstacles that I've had to deal with. I can go on and on about my experiences from the time I was a child into becoming an adult now. Nothing has changed. Socially or academically, my experiences are similar. People are uninformed and not interested in accommodating me or understanding my deafness. I think it's really time for us to create an environment that is accessible for us with disabilities and deafness. It is time for people to look into intersectionality. I bring this up because oftentimes people assume I am dumb because of a stereotype connected to deaf people for centuries or because of my black skin. In reality, I just can't hear, and this has no correlation to my other social identities. I'm asking that everyone in this audience start a conversation about disability and deafness today, not tomorrow, not next month, not next year, right now, in this moment. Someone needs you to be their voice and help make a change. I can't advocate alone. We have to stand together and learn and create a socially acceptable environment where people with disabilities and deafness can coexist with one another, with those who do not have these disabilities or deafness. Students, staff, faculty, I ask that you please help contribute to making a change for the climate at the University of Michigan. I may be graduating within a few, in a few months, but let's be a voice for the next class and so on. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my story. And thank you, Kayla. So our next presenter is going to be Ashley Wiseman. Ashley is the Associate Director of the Global Scholars Program here at the University of Michigan and involved with a number of projects advancing disability culture on campus. Uh, her description reads, white cisgender woman, very slender, with dark brown hair past her shoulders. I told her I was gonna do that. Uh, brown eyes and glasses. 
Ashley uses a power wheelchair and has a golden retriever service dog named Reason. And do you want me to add anything else? No, I'm good. I'm just trying to get out of that white <laughs> shining in my face. All right. Hold on. No, well, I mean, okay, yeah, I guess you don't really need that, do you? Y'all can remember my name? Okay, I'll stay here. Cool. I'll pass it off to you then, and I'm going to slide, slide past you. Down. Good girl. Okay. <sighs> Thank you to the tenacious students who have organized this event and who are giving all of us a platform to share tonight. Um, we desperately need more opportunities to connect with one another and to share our stories of disability. My name is Ashley. Uh, I might be the only non-student speaking tonight, but um, I was a grad student here at the U of M, so it still counts, I guess. Um, I've worked here for about five years. I was born disabled. I have a very rare neuropathy that caused me to walk with a not noticeable difference as a kid. And by the time I graduated high school, I was using a power wheelchair full time. Avoiding my own community is one of the first memories I have of being a college student. It was the student organization recruitment fair. As I made my way through the crowds, I saw a table <coughs> with a banner that said, Organization for the Advancement of Students with Disabilities. A man using a wheelchair was out in front of the table so he could more easily approach people with the information. I thought to myself, he's going to see me, a wheelchair user, and he's going to try to recruit me. So I steered as far across the aisle as I could, <laughs> putting as many people between us as possible. I considered myself better than him, better than all of them. I didn't want to be affiliated with them. I wanted to be normal. It would be years before I learned that what I was so desperately trying to steer away from that day was <coughs> disability stigma, not disabled people. It would be years before I opened myself up to this beautiful community of people who share similar experiences to mine, who share an interdependent rather than independent way of being, who share disability norms, disability history, disability culture. When I think back to that moment, I'm very sad. I learned so well what disability culture scholar Carol Gill calls society's relentless instruction in disabled people hating ourselves and each other. I am sad that I arrived on campus that day and did not immediately recognize that disabled student as one of my own community. So I want to talk tonight about disability pride, how important it is, and some of the ways I learned to practice getting proud. As a white, straight, upper middle class, US born, physically disabled, cisgender woman, I have a lot of privilege. For example, I've had access to many resources, including education, People with my skin color are widely represented, even within the otherwise underrepresented disability community. I meet many dominant beauty standards because those standards have been established by largely non-disabled people who otherwise look like me. No one in my family has told me, Ashley, our people don't have disabilities because my family is not battling the internalized shame that comes along with the legacy of racism, colonialism, and imperialism. What I'm trying to say is, it's easier for me to access sources of pride, and that's important for me to acknowledge as I share some of my experiences. I'm going to begin with an excerpt <coughs> from a poem called You Get Proud by Practicing by disabled poet Laura Hershey. In this poem, she encourages disabled people to practice loving the lives they lead rather than measuring themselves 
against the standards designed for non-disabled people. She closes her poem with this. It is music when you practice opening your mouth and liking what you hear because it is the sound of your own true voice. It is sunlight when you practice seeing strength and beauty in everyone, including yourself. It is dance when you practice knowing that what you do and the way you do it is the right way for you and cannot be called wrong. All these hold more power than weapons or money or lies. All these practices bring power and power makes you proud. You get proud by practicing. Remember, you weren't the one who made you ashamed, but you are the one who can make you proud. Just practice. Practice until you get proud, and once you are proud, keep practicing so you won't forget. You get proud by practicing. Hershey taught me that pride is something I have to cultivate. And it's OK if it doesn't work right away. Learning how to be proud means doing the difficult work of unlearning all of those ways I've been hot, taught to hate myself and people like me. I was taught that disability is a problem with me. Doctors tried to fix my body regardless of the physical or emotional toll it took on me. I grew up with no understanding of disabled people's collective history. In my later years of college, I began to learn about a painful history of institutionalized abuse, forced isolation, eugenics, <coughs> compulsory sterilization, targeted murder, and anti-disability bias in medicine, religious, religion, education, employment, media, art, <coughs> sports, relationships, and essentially every aspect of society one can think of. Practicing getting proud meant learning about the powerful disabled activists who risked arrest and even their lives for civil disobedience, who started self-advocacy move movements and organizations, who fundamentally changed the way we think about disability justice. Practicing <laughs> getting proud means knowing we are still out here doing the work writing disability history every day. I was taught that disability was my problem, but I learned that ableism is society's problem. I was taught to hate my body. I hated the curved shape of my spine. I hated my fingers, which don't stay straightened and instead stay closed against my palm. I hated being so thin. When I looked in the mirror, ableism spoke to me in a voice that sounded like my own, and it said terrible things that I won't repeat. Where's Nita? Nita, will you give me a hand? I'm arguing with these pages and they're winning. Okay. Yeah, you can just hold that for me. I'm still on this page. I'm still on the previous page. <laughs> I did not prepare her for this. Yes, please. Okay. So I was taught to hate my body, as I was saying. Practicing getting proud meant taking advice from Harlan Rousseau author of Don't Call Me Inspirational, a disabled feminist talks back. Rousseau has cerebral palsy, and to cultivate acceptance of her body, she paints parts of her body that she feels insecure about. This helps her to think about her body as shapes, neither good nor bad. I'm not a painter, but I write poetry and I like words. This energized me to describe the parts of my body I was most self-conscious about, using positive or at least neutral words. I described my body as abstract, like art, or deviating, like a badass, and meandering, like a serene forest path. 
I told myself that my narrow body was to be treasured, like something rare and precious. This simple exercise was life-changing. When ableism began to whisper insults in my mind, I gently replaced each abusive word with a new plain or pretty one. It didn't always work. It took practice. Sometimes I didn't and don't believe myself, and I believed ableism instead. But I can tell you today, I do love my body. It is many kinds of weak and strong, uncomfortable and comfortable, disabled and abled, and I love it because it teaches me patience, vulnerability, humility, compassion, creativity, and wisdom every day. I was taught to hate my body, but I learned it is my VIP ticket to disability country. I was taught that I am a burden, especially to family, close friends, and intimate partners. At some point, nearly all of my best friends have been told a variation of, you are so wonderful for being such a good friend to Ashley, as if the friendship is one way. After dating my high school sweetheart for six years and living together for two of them, his dad, reflecting on my disability, told him, I don't know how you do it. My now ex-boyfriend responded, what? I love her. Practicing getting proud has meant learning how disability culture rests on interdependence, adaptability, being honest about our needs and receptive to the needs of others. And these are wonderful qualities in a partner and a friend. In fact, <coughs> interdependence offers beautiful moments of intimacy <clears throat> that few people get to experience as I do and those close to me do. I wrote a poem about one of these moments, which I'd like to share. And I've never read a poem <coughs> that I've written in front of a crowd before. So send me a little love. <laughs> All right. All right, that's working. It's working for me. I'm thirsty, and so I begin to drag my cup toward me, but it hits a snag. There's a ridge, a rut in the table. I can't lift the glass, and he's able. So I move my plate left out of the way. No need to wait. No need to say anything. Because instead, he put the cup where I need it already. I sip from there. Conversation unbroken. <coughs> I finish my drink. Understanding unspoken. Our minds in sync. He moves the cup back. I move the plate right. I soak up this plate that's part of the night. Again, we repeat a rhythmic reflection to a beat of mutual affection. I was taught that I'm a burden, but I've learned I have no desire to be with someone who doesn't want to live in these interdependent moments with me. I started tonight by telling you I was taught that I should avoid disabled people in order to feel normal. Practicing getting proud has, mind, has meant finding sanctuary in the gentle understanding of those who live with me on the margin. I find comfort and strength in our interdependent ways of being and our dreams of a world where difference is honored rather than suppressed. I was taught that I should avoid disabled people, but I learned I am proud to be in community with you. I keep practicing. Keeping society's relentless instruction at bay is ongoing work. When I notice I'm feeling shame, I ask myself, do I want to live in a world where we consider that shameful? And if I feel safe enough, and I have enough energy to do the emotional labor, I practice. Maya Angelou, and it's not widely talked about that Maya Angelou <laughs> experienced disability. For five years as a child, she had selective mutism. Maya Angelou once said, if you are always trying to be normal, you'll never know how amazing you can be. So I keep practicing. Thank you.
Thank you, Ashley. Next up, we have Ryan Roos, pronounced like goose, but with an R, as he told me. He's a senior, a communications major, who is always looking to spread love and support. Uh, Ryan is just under 5'9", a little skinny, white, with long, curly, dark brown hair. He's also wearing a yellow university, yellow and yellow, gold. Is it blue and gold? Maze. Maze. I'm sorry, folks. I've been here for two years. I have no excuse. Maize and blue cap with the University of Michigan M, a striped sweater. It's always a good time for that. And blue jeans. I'm going to welcome him up here now. Come here, Ryan. Am I allowed to use the handheld mic? I just don't like standing still very much. OK. I'm on. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Sorry. I have my outline on my phone because, I don't know, technology. So my name is Ryan Roos. I'm a senior here studying communications. Uh, and the reason I'm up here today is kind of talk about specifically my ADHD and then a little more generally ADHD. But uh, I didn't, I have ADHD now, but I wasn't diagnosed until I was 21. Um, when I was younger, I kind of used to joke about the idea that I had ADHD. My mind would drift from one subject to another, from stimulus to stimulus, and I couldn't really focus on anything for longer than like the duration of one conversation. And even that, I usually would only pay attention to the last like seven words people would say, repeat them, and then they would just assume I understood what they were talking about. <laughs> it's clever, but you really don't learn much that way. So by the time, fast forward about like 10 years, and then I turned 21, and I'm nearly failing my classes, struggling academically. And we were in my psych class, and for about a week, we had talked about ADHD. And that's when I was like, all right, maybe younger me was on to something. Like, I thought I was different. Maybe I grew up and thought I was just a little awkward, but I thought maybe there was something else going on. So I Googled ADHD, and the list of the medical symptoms, I'll call them symptoms, because like, I just don't like the idea that there's like symptoms for ADHD because it's not really like, I just don't like to view it in a negative light. It's not necessarily a bad thing and I don't like the idea of viewing disability as a bad thing either. But so I Googled it and the medical symptoms, as I say, they seem to apply to me pretty strongly. So then I decided to Google a little further and see what type of stories people had, what type of themes, what was kind of like similar among multiple people with ADHD. And a lot of those anecdotes tend to match a lot of my personal experiences. So that made me more interested in it. And at 21 years old, I had to go find an adult, an adult ADHD psychiatrist, which believe it or not, can be very, very difficult. It took quite a while, but I was able to find one and after going through the tests, sorry, the tests and the screenings, he confirmed exactly what I had thought when I was younger, that I have ADHD. When I was younger and I would joke about it, I was told I didn't have ADHD because my grades were too good, which meant, you know, oh, if you have ADHD, you must be stupid. And obviously that isn't the case. ADHD is far more complex than whether or not someone is intelligent as are disabilities in general. But moving on from that, I need to check my outline. <laughs> oh, so yeah, kind of, I already touched on that. Um, more importantly, our, the way ADHD affects people, it kind of affects each person differently. And as, as a result, I think it's crucial that when we're finding treatment for our disabilities, more so than treatment, I think about accommodations and resources to help us thrive without the idea that we need some type of aid or assistance or else we're incapable of doing it on our own because that's not how it is. It's more or less that we function differently. We function abnormally, so to speak, and so we've been cast into this other group that needs assistance, and then now there's just this whole economy running on providing those assistance and resources and treatments for people who, in reality, are just trying to find the best way for them to learn. And going off of that, I think it's important that each treatment and each uh, resource or accommodation is very individualized. The way we are all affected is very different. My ADHD is not the same as some of my friends' ADHD, and as a result, our treatments and accommodations might be a little different. 
And the ideal way to ensure that people, specifically with ADHD, but with any disability in general, are able to succeed is that their plan matches up and aligns with what they are most, or the way that they learn or the way that they function. If you try and give everyone with ADHD the exact same treatment, or there would be like, I don't know, 54 milligrams of Concerta, I think that's what I take now, but uh, if everyone else had that, I don't know if that would work. And I don't think it would because it affects us differently. So it's important to make sure that we have the resources that align with our personal goals and our personal styles of learning. I wish my phone didn't lock itself. Uh, with that in mind, I'm sure that many of us have been told that the resources and accommodations or treatments that we may get, they're kind of an unfair advantage or they give us a step up on normal people. And I really think that's a horribly cynical way of viewing it, so to speak. I think it's more so unfair that in order for me to learn at school, I have to take Ritalin, not that I get, to, or I said Ritalin there, but it's actually Concerta now, sorry. It's, I think it's crazy that people think it's unfair that I have to, or that I get to take Ritalin or Concerta when in reality it's that I need to take it if I want to learn or else I can't function in the type of academic environment and system that we have all grown up in. And so accommodations and in treatment, in my mind, should more prioritize equity over prioritizing equality. Because equity ensures that we're all on a level playing field, and it ensures that we all have the same opportunities for success. It accommodates naturally what would be barriers or obstacles for each of us to succeed, and I think when we look to try and throw blanket treatments at people with similar disabilities, it causes problems. And I think going further than that and looking to create a societal system that not only benefits normal people, but works for the benefit of everyone, regardless of their disability, regardless of where they come from, I think that's the type of society that really offers the most for its people and provides people with ample opportunity to grow and learn without feeling that they're somehow less better of a person or less intelligent than the people around them because they have to be labeled with a disability to get the accommodations they need in order to succeed in that environment that doesn't favor their style of learning or their style of life. And finally, I'd like to, I think it's really beneficial, and actually um, Bradley, his talk touched on this much more eloquently than I could he said it a lot better than I could, so I'll try and be brief with it. But I think it's important to remember that when we are labeled as disabled people, oftentimes the word disabled comes before person, and that can make us feel more like our disabilities define us and our disabilities are us, rather than we are people who have disabilities. And even then, I'm still not a huge supporter of the idea of calling them disabilities because they're only disabilities because the system we live in doesn't enable us to function normally. But beyond that, I think it's important to remember that our humanity is not reflected in our disabilities. Our strengths are what we often should be. Am I doing something? No, I didn't though. No. Oh, OK. Sorry. But I think it's important to remember that our disabilities don't define us. You know, We are all people before we are disabled, and it's important to recognize how we want to be viewed as people, and that, to me, I think Bradley went in and elaborated on that a lot better than I could, but you know, we don't define athletes by their inabilities in other aspects or by their weaker traits. We don't define the greatest scientists by their lack of a Olympic gold medals. We don't define the greatest artists by their lack of ability to do high-level calculus. So why then should we define us by our weaknesses when instead, much like the greats in our society, we could be defined by our strengths? Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. 
Next up, we're going to have Sarah Caratero, who is a junior majoring in gender and health. Uh, their pronouns are they, them, theirs, or she, her, hers. Uh, Sarah's physical description is as follows. Five foot two, white slash Latina. Hair is short, but long enough that she can cover her eyes with her hair. Swept over her right side and kind of messy. Right now, she's wearing a knit cap, green jacket, and a blue button down. Uh, I will let them come on up. Is the mic working? Oh, wow. I always wanted to like use one of these things. I always see them on like TV shows or like conferences or whatever. These like little mics that look really fancy. Um, so, oh gosh, that was really loud. Sorry. Um, so I wrote this pretty recently. <laughs> So that's just a, a little bit of a warning that I might be editing on the spot. But um, uh, a word I've been thinking about a lot recently, um, again, <laughs> yesterday, um, <laughs> was the word invisibility. Um, like many people, I have uh, you know, what's known as an invisible illness. Uh, most of the time, I don't really fit people's image of a sick person. And I think that that frames my experience of other kinds of invisibility. Um, so in order to explain what I mean, I have to clarify that the kind of invisibility I'm talking about is influenced by, but does not require an identity to, be, to not be obvious. Um, there are two kinds of um, visibility um, or invisibility, one in which some important part of you goes unacknowledged and one in which some part of you is misunderstood and or acknowledged in the wrong way. Um, so for me, the first kind of invisibility, the type that involves a, a lack of acknowledgement, is often in the form of some kind of conversation centered around a, a hypothetical person um, that resembles me, but is presumed to exist somewhere outside of that conversation, that room, this university. Um, I remember my first semester, um, <laughs> one of my first classes, the professor was talking about angiogenesis, um, which is like blood vessel formation, and how our knowledge of the role of angiogenesis in tumor growth has led to um, anti-angiogenesis cancer treatments. And then she, she names the drug um, Avastin. And she talks about why, unfortunately, Avastin hasn't been as effective in the treatment of cancer as hoped. Now, in this instance, there's a theoretical person somewhere who knows where in the world, and that person, having resorted to this relatively new drug after um, exhausting the established cancer treatment options, is dealing with a grave disappointment. Um, and that theoretical person is me in the middle of this lecture hall still with this like needle-thin scab over my port from the last infusion of Avastin. Um, and soon after that, I did get some news that was uh, disappointing. <laughs> uh, more recently, I'm a junior now, one of my classes had to role play the hypo hypothetical situation of a doctor informing a young patient that the treatment isn't working, that the cancer is spreading, and that their only remaining option is a clinical trial drug which both the effectiveness and the side effects are still fairly unknown. A professor assured us that even if we weren't planning on becoming doctors, which a lot of people in the room were, um, thinking of the scenario might be helpful to us as potential patients. A student later stated in this like little feedback session um, to a crowd of nods that the situation was very sad, uh, but it had to be noted probably not relevant to anyone in the class. <laughs> Um, and so here I am, six years past a diagnosis, um, and the most intense treatment five years <laughs> from the other kind of chemo, and three years from the other kind, and two years from Avastin, and now in a clinical trial. Um, and a few months earlier, I had that exact conversation. The professor was um, even talked about acting in the role of a patient, about coming up with a realistic reaction to that kind of news. Um, 
I've gotten very familiar with that kind of news and how I react to it. Um, for the record, I'm like overly casual. I make jokes that just make everyone in the room very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and even in the stress of that moment in the classroom, I like I laughed. I did like a Jim from the office look into like the camera <laughs> because I didn't have like anyone else to acknowledge the situation with me. So I just like I was just like <laughs> out into space. Um, So I think that kind of invisibility both stems from and produces a second kind of invisibility, um, the invisibility of being misunderstood and acknowledged in the wrong kind of way, um, at least in my case. Um, I like to think that I'm a kind of person that could exist to anyone, that nobody is assuming who I am in that way, but moments like that make it clear that that's not true. And I think that stems from the idea that cancer is a thing that people either live through or die from, that it's an event, an event that stays with you, that maybe repeats, but an event that just interrupts normal life. Um, and in that framework, there are people who grow up with cancer, who go through high school with it, who go through college with it, who become adults with it. And so that's why it's so hard to make myself visible in, that, in those situations because everyone knows what cancer is. But to a lot of people, cancer means something very different than it does to me. Um, in the very early days, <laughs> I used to get get well soon cards, <laughs> which even then felt, uh, felt very inappropriate. Um, and a lot of the sympathy I get now still feels like a weird relative of that. Um, I wish I didn't have cancer. I don't think it's like taught me any lesson or given me any gift that, you know, I wouldn't trade not having cancer for. Um, but I do wish when people say, I'm sorry, that I could tell them that I've had a lot of good breakfasts with cancer, I've seen a lot of good movies with cancer, you know what I mean? Um, I wish I could say that I'm not telling them about something that I'm dealing with, I'm telling about them about who I am. Um, and you know, sympathy means something, but uh, what I want is to be seen. All right. Uh, thank you, Sarah. So <clears throat> next we have another pair of videos. We're actually just going to show one of them just because we're running a little behind on time. Um, and if anybody does have to get going, we understand. It's a Thursday night. It's a school night. Um, so anyway, uh, Lena Drevs uh, is a, another student on the uh, SSD Student Advisory Board. <laughs> Uh, she is a junior majoring in public policy in the Ford School. I believe Dennis McGrath is also majoring in public policy, but don't quote me on that. You can quote him when you watch the video. Uh, so they're both on our SSD Student Advisory Board. Um, these videos are part of a series that Lena is working on uh, to sh talk more about members of the SSD Student Advisory Board as part of a disability justice campaign. Uh, we're hoping to share different versions of these videos later uh, through social media and other means to raise awareness about disabilities um, and greater acceptance of disabilities and disabled experiences on campus and throughout the SSD. Uh, we'll post these videos, these two, on the event page later so folks can watch them. Without further ado. I was born with cerebral palsy, which is essentially paralysis of the brain. For me specifically, cerebral palsy affects my leg muscles. It makes my leg muscles very tight and taut, and because of that, it's more difficult for me to walk and do other physical things that involve my legs. 
One of the biggest influences in my life has been my physical therapist, Sherry Connor. My physical therapist also introduced me to the world of Paralympic swimming. Up until that point, I had been competing in a lot of different able-bodied sports. It was very, very difficult for me because I'm an incredibly competitive person. I was working really, really hard, but I had to work almost twice as hard as everybody else just to do basic things. Once I discovered Paralympic swimming, I really found an arena where I could really showcase my talent and the work that I had been putting in. And that in conjunction with joining my high school swim team really gave me a platform to finally excel at a physical activity, which is something that I had dreamed of from a young age. I remember I started competing at national and international competitions. I won a gold medal at the Can-Am National Championships in Edmonton, Canada, and then later competed at the 2016 Paralympic Trials. Doing those things was really sort of the culmination of that sense of self-belief that my parents had given me and the tools that my physical therapist had given me to achieve those goals. When people meet me and we're sitting down having a conversation in class or something like that, they treat me a certain way, but the second that they see me walking with a limp or if I tell them that I have cerebral palsy, they treat me completely differently. And I think that this applies to most disabilities, but having a disability is only one facet of our personalities. There's so much more to us than just having a disability. We are not disabled people, we are people with disabilities. Thank you to Dennis and to Lena. Again, we will have these videos, both of them, posted later on the event page. And keep an eye, ear, other body parts and mind parts out for more videos. So next up is someone who many people here already know, uh, Fizz, or Felicity, but Fizz, F-I-Z-Z, -Z, uh, Harfield, uh, who is the mistress of ceremonies? I don't know. I'm the master of ceremonies. That's what she is uh, today. Uh, Fizz is a senior studying psychology. She's a member of the SSD Student Advisory Board, which is putting it lightly. Uh, she is a white cisgender woman. She's 5'4", with shoulder length, wavy hair. Uh, that's kind of between red and brown, or auburn, something like that. Uh, she has brown eyes with uh, oval glasses. She's wearing jeans, a green top with a blue cardigan and black boots. And I'd like to welcome Fizz up here. Hello. Um, <laughs> the reason why Jeff said that uh, the mistress of ceremony thing is because if you got an email about this event, there's a high chance that I sent it. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of work for this, and I'm really <laughs> thankful that you guys all came. Uh, this event, uh, I'm one of the organizers, obviously. Um, it was the last big thing on my list of things I want to do before I graduate. So I really am thankful that you guys are all here today. Um, so to begin, I like to describe myself as someone who thinks through their fingertips. That's just a fancy way of saying I'm a writer. Um, but today, I'm going to read two pieces that I've written. And I wrote these points at different points of my acceptance of my disabilities. Uh, the first, first one I wrote about two years ago, um, and it was an eye-opener for me. You'll hear in a bit, but when I wrote this and I read it through, I realized how empty and how I wasn't dealing with my seasonal depression. I wasn't dealing with what I was going through. Um, in fact, I couldn't really write the last part of it where I'm asking for help until quite recently. Uh, the second one is about my dyslexia, a lot more easier to talk about, um, and my road to accepting the thing that I used to, that used to make me so self-deprecating but has turned into my self-expression. So this first one is called Slipping Away. <laughs> I started off talking about Humpty Dumpty, so I laugh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. You were just sitting there, doing nothing, simply being. Yet you feel yourself start slipping away. At that moment, Humpty Dumpty lost his balance. Your identity, your happiness, your happy self, the one you are known to be, you feel it slip away. Sometimes it's gradual as the day goes on, losing it little by little with each footstep you take. Others, it feels like you are never happy at all. When Humpty Dumpty started to fall, somebody noticed. They see it. 
They see it in your eyes how the spark of joy that once was so ever-present has started to fade, like a life force being drained from your being. They know, but you don't want them to know, because if they know, they might understand what you're going through. And you don't want them to know this emptiness you feel inside. So you hide it. And that decision is how Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. But then you reach a point and you feel like you might break. And if you keep this inside of you any longer, the fragile shell of emptiness that you have become will shatter into a million pieces. So who can you tell? What can you say? You've hidden this part of you, the real you, the real emotions you feel. I'm sorry, the lack of real emotions you feel. You've hidden it from everyone from far too long. Humpty Dumpty has been broken, broken but yet won't tell a soul. So you find a friend, the strongest of all the king's men, the one who will listen and who actually hear what you say. Because you know when you speak, when you finally say how you feel, you will hear a giggle of laughter. Not from them, but from yourself. Because you know if you don't laugh, you'll cry. And you don't want to cry. So you find yourself a friend who will listen, who won't ignore your outcry, who will tell you that the emotions you feel are real and valid, who will help you be put back together again. You tell them how you've barely survived. You try to let them put you back together again. So kind of dark. <laughs> um, and then this one. <laughs> Thank you. This one's slightly happier, uh, or ends happier anyway. <laughs> um, this one is what I call a metaphor of my words. My entire life I've hated words. I can't stand them. I avoided them like the plague. You see, not only could I hardly ever spell them correctly, but every time I wrote them in order in a sentence, every word was simply... Oop, nope, I'm skipping over lines. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you can tell I practiced. <laughs> um, I avoided them like the plague. You see, not only could I hardly ever spell them correctly or know which order to place them in a sentence, every word that were, even the ones that were simple, that I learned in elementary school ended up with red squiggly lines underneath, symbolizing, as all red lines do, that I was wrong. My hatred for them only grew as I started to observe the world, listening to others' use of words and seeing that they weren't used for communication, but in cruelty. They had this ability to cut you like a knife. That little rhyme, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a flat out lie. <laughs> My anger grew into an obsession, observing words, collecting them almost like I was a hoarder. I collected sentences and phrases as if the world was coming to an end and that was the new type of currency. I was trying to decipher how they were used, how I could conquer and destroy them. My hatred for words grew even more, running from books unless forced to by evil English teachers who reveled in my struggles and assigning more books to read and more essays to write. But then a funny thing happened. My words became mine, my shield and my sword, my paintbrush and my canvas. I used them to express myself. I used them to understand my thoughts. I used them and they helped me understand me. I couldn't comprehend how this transition had happened. I couldn't understand how these words, words I had despised my entire life, were now my lifeline to my world to my thoughts, my feelings, and aspirations. My words became my friend. Words became my sanctuary, and words are how I became my biggest advocate. Words were no longer tools used by others for the mass destruction of each other's emotions. They were gifts of love and joy, used to build someone up until they felt like a king, used to alter someone until they felt confident in their own skin. I no longer hoarded them looking for their weakness, I collected them, appreciating them for their wonder as if they were the most precious gem in the universe, passed down through the generations. I marveled at their ability to create peace, to create worlds that surpassed our imagination. Words went from being the death of me to being my safe haven. I finally saw how we could use our words to dis as descriptive tools to explain our world instead of using them to end other people's. Thanks. <laughs> A 
got a little bit more, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so clearly I'm a lot more comfortable talking about my dyslexia. It's a little bit more positive. Um, I've been dealing with that since I was seven years old, um, while the seasonal depression is a lot newer to me. And obviously it's a form of depression, so it's slightly depressing. Um, <laughs> I could tell you that my story of my life, but that won't explain to you how it truly feels to come to terms with a disability. I wrote these pieces at different points and parts of the process of accepting my disabilities. So I kind of hope these can give you an idea of the frustration, but eventual positives that come from the process of acceptance. If it wasn't for this process, I wouldn't feel so comfortable and confident in who I am. I'm my own self-advocate, and I found what I'm passionate about, which just happens to be advocating for those who aren't yet comfortable and creating events like this. Um, it's a process to accept that you are not able to do something that society tells you you're hardwired to do. And everyone's at a different part of that process. I hope that one day everyone can be comfortable in their identity and how that connects to their disability if it connects at all. But until then, I hope that we can all respect the process, respect each other and respectfully educate those who aren't doing just that. Thank you. Thank you, Fizz. So we have one more presenter, uh, but before that, I would just want to thank everybody again for coming. We've had, I think, over 60 people drop in, which is fantastic for this kind of event. I don't know if we've had that many before, so yay. First time. Woo! Woo. Uh, so um, I also wanted to take a moment to thank the other folks who helped make this possible. I want to thank our uh, CART provider who has been providing real-time captioning services. Uh, thank you, Sue. Uh, I'd like to thank our American Sign Language interpreters. Uh, this wonderful pair has been providing interpretation throughout the entirety of this event, and we are very thankful, so thank you, too. And our library staff hiding in the back where I'm hiding, or have been hiding, they made this possible through the technology and made it so that we could have Facebook live streaming. Hello, Facebook. Uh, I'll be back again after this next person speaks, but I think that's enough for now. Just want to acknowledge. Uh, so our final person coming up is Hannah Buck. Uh, Hannah is a proud fifth year student at U of M majoring in creative writing and minoring in digital studies. She was born with cystic fibrosis, a genetic progressive disease that most notably causes lung decline and eventually failure. She is passionate about disability advocacy and is currently working on a book of essays and short stories centered around chronic illness, mental health, and disability. She is one of two 2019 National Ambassadors for Great Strides, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's biggest fundraiser for cystic fibros fibrosis cure research. After she graduates this May, she plans on moving to Brooklyn to pursue her dreams. Hannah is 5'5", white or Caucasian. She has short, curly, blonde, brown hair, round tortoiseshell glasses, wearing dark jeans, and a shirt with an asthma inhaler that says, ain't easy, being wheezy, and then it says another thing, just breathe, and it is purple and blue and really funny. I'm gonna let Hannah take it away. I'm nervous. Okay, uh, I had three things I wanted to say. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. As the last speaker, I just feel I have to acknowledge how incredible the energy in this room has been. So many of, gosh dang it. <laughs> dang it. <laughs> so many of you guys made me cry. <laughs> Not because I was sad, but because I feel such a weird sense of immediate kinship with you guys. So thank you to everyone who spoke. It's been so amazing. Um, there are two trigger warnings in this for um, suicide and weight, weight loss. <clears throat> and lastly, I am someone who actually prefers identity first 
language as many people in my community of people with this illness do. So <clears throat> it's called Don't Tell Me I Inspire You. <clears throat> I didn't choose to have blue eyes, but I do. I was born, I opened my little tiny baby eyes, and lo and behold, they were blue. It was a thing. The same goes for my freckles, my frizzy hair, the scar on my right knee from an old stubborn wart, though I suppose it was my choice to get that wart frozen off in the first place, so that's a bad example. My point is, I have, as do you, a massive genome, and with that genome, approximately 20,000 genes. Many of these genes directly or indirectly determine a phenotype, a physical expression of my and your DNA. While our environments can sometimes affect how these genes are expressed, our genotypes themselves are off limits to us. You get what you get. And sometimes you throw a fit, as I often do, about my frizzy hair. One of the rarest genotypes in my code <clears throat> is the double delta F508 mutation in my cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulatory gene, or my CFTR gene, located on my seventh chromosome. We all have a CFTR gene, but chances are yours is unmutated or unaffected. But I want to give a shout out to Sarah for reminding me that we never know who's in the room. So. Maybe you do have CF, in which case, yeah. I feel confident saying that I'm the only person in the room with a doubly mutated CFTR gene because that causes cystic fibrosis, a disease that only 30,000 people in the United States have. In the entire world, 70,000. Cystic fibrosis, or CF, is progressive, which means it only gets worse over time, despite strict compliance with medications and treatments. It's also incurable, and to be honest, that can be a pretty big bummer because the median life expectancy of people with CF is around 39 years old. Only 50% of people with CF are over 18. My health has declined severely since I moved into Alice Lloyd in September of 2014. Over these past four and a half years, I have literally visited the, visited the emergency room more times than I can count, and I went back and tried for you guys, I couldn't count it. I've been admitted to the hospital a similarly uncountable number of times, adding up to literally hundreds of days. I've gone from around 80% lung function to 34% lung function with a lot of ups and downs in between. I've had a portacath placed in my chest for easier IV access, had my fifth sinus surgery, was diagnosed with mixed anxiety depressive disorder, which kind of makes sense since people with chronic illnesses are estimated to be affected by mental illness around six times more than healthy people. I had an ambulance called on me in a Panera Bread because I started coughing up blood for the first but not the last time. I received a $700 bill in the mail 15 months after that ambulance ride which I still have not paid, and I will not pay. <laughs> I became iron deficient and thusly anemic, and then I developed an allergy to iron pills and thusly became even more anemic. I unintentionally lost over 30 pounds. I passed out, hit my head, had a seizure, received six stitches, which eventually created a small nickel-sized uh, bald spot which I will turn around and show you if you want to look at it. Like right there. Really fun. I was harassed on an airplane for coughing too much. I developed arthropathy or chronic joint pain. I contemplated suicide multiple times. And I have been constipated for way longer than I would have preferred. But. I also met my best friend in the last 4.5 years. I found veganism. I became the president of a badass trash can drumming group. I've fallen in love and out of love, and in love and out of love, and in, you get it, you get the point. 
I was an espresso royale barista for a while. I tried beer for the first time and decided I didn't like it. I started writing a book. I started a YouTube channel. I got a dog. My life is filled with wonderful, beautiful things. And I just want to know who has the authority to decide that these experiences are any less noteworthy or exciting than the health-related things I have experienced. Yes, it's true that in the pits of my illness, when I can barely breathe, I sometimes wonder if my life is worth fighting for. I wonder if I made a mistake enrolling in college when there's a chance I might never be well enough to enter the workforce, put my bachelor's degree to use, or pay off my student loans. Because, like, why would you want to die off and leave your, leave your parents with those student loans? That's not cool. I question if I want to continue dealing with daily pain and failing lungs. But somehow, I always swing back. Ultimately, I always remember to look at the people and the opportunities around me. And I realize that there is so, so much to be grateful for. That I am lucky to be alive, to still be alive and that I am a loved girl inside a container that just so happens to not work very well. I'm just a girl. I'm just a person. And with all of that said, I hope my existence doesn't inspire you. My existence shouldn't inspire you. The mere fact that I am alive should not be enough to inspire you. If it is, I'd like you to ask yourself, and I have a feeling that the people I'm talking to here are not the awesome people in this room right now. I'd like you to ask yourself, what does this say about how you view my life? What does this say about how you view the chronically ill population in general or the greater disabled population? Is it actually amazing that we exist? Or are our lives just different than the one that you know? Are our lives actually tragic, sad, or pitiful? Or do we just have different problems than you? The truth is, you inspire me. You, the student with a 3.8 GPA. You, the person who runs marathons. You, the person celebrating one month, or two years and two months, sober. You, the single parent. You, the student org founder. You, who moved across the country to Ann Arbor knowing no one, all because you wanted to equip yourself with the armor that a college education provides. The things you do inspire me. The way you treat people. The way you smiled today even though you felt sad and the way that you guys talked about your stories on stage. Not your DNA. Not your phenotype. Not your abilities or your disabilities. So please don't tell me that I inspire you. Not unless you've looked at what I've done and who I am. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to share one thing with you guys. As was mentioned, I'm a national ambassador for Great Strides, which is the biggest national fundraiser from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation to raise money to cure CF. And believe it or not, we're really, really close. CF is called the most curable, incurable disease. So this is my team, a healthy fam, because my name on social media and YouTube is a healthy hand as in Hannah. And so if you Google CFF, Great Strides, a healthy fam, or search for the Ann Arbor Walk, you should be able to find this. And even if you don't raise any money, if you just add your name to my team, it helps so much to develop a sense of solidarity and community. So I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. So that's going to take us to the end of Speakable 2019. Uh, once again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, this has been a huge event. Uh, it's gotten better and better each year. I don't know, I think she was acknowledged earlier by Dr. Kellum, but I want to acknowledge Megan Marshall one more time. She is in the back of the room by the drinks. 
Uh, Megan is a former student of the University of Michigan. She couldn't stay away. She's a wonderful coordinator for the SSD, and we love her very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, if it weren't for her, this kind of event wouldn't be going on, and the Student Advisory Board wouldn't be as wonderful as it is today and continues to get. Um, I'd like to leave folks with a few closing thoughts. We're just past eight, so we're doing, we're doing great. We're doing great. Um, thank you again to all our speakers, um, and also talk to Fizz after the presentation. There's a surprise. Um, all the stories we heard today are very, very different from one another, um, and go to show that there's not one way of being disabled or having a disability or being different or however one chooses to define oneself. There are many ways of being and existing and be having a body or mind or being that differs from what people expect. Um, and there's a lot of learning to be done. I hope that the people here learn something from the folks who chose to come out. And I hope that people continue to spread that knowledge throughout our community and beyond. Many of the folks you heard speak um, and folks who are here, myself included, are leaving after this term. Uh, we uh, have enjoyed our time at the University of Michigan and we've been thrilled to have the resources to do events like Speakable and spread information like this and raise disability awareness and meet other people who care. Um, but the work needs to continue. So to those of you who are sticking around, to those of you who live in this community, to those of you who know others who aren't sticking around but want to step up, roll up, or you know, take charge, uh, invite them to this space. Invite them to your personal spaces. There are some folks who aren't here. There are some folks who don't aren't comfortable talking like this, and that's okay. Uh, we need to create those spaces out in our community, and we can do that. Uh, the university uh, has no shortage of issues that uh, need addressing when it comes to disability. Uh, we did a campus climate survey several years ago as part of our diversity, equity, inclusion plan and found that 48% of students with disabilities feel discriminated against on campus. It's the highest percentage of any student population by race, gender, sexuality, sexual orientation, or creed. Um, so there's clearly work to be done. There is progress being made. Sometimes it's slow. Sometimes it needs a little bit of pushing and a little bit of friction. And I think tonight, with the, some of the ideas that may have challenged some of the folks in the audience, some of the ideas that may have uh, supported folks in the audience or made them feel part of a larger community, uh, we can take those and continue them past tonight's event. So I encourage you, if you can, stick around, talk to some of those folks if they're comfortable, engage in these conversations as they, as they keep coming, and go to more events like this, support more events like this, and push for more uh, discussion and more change around disability, accommodation, inclusion, other types of things that our community really needs. Um, that's pretty much all I've got. So thank you again to all of you who've come, all of you who made this event possible. And speakers, don't forget to see Fizz over in the back. Thank you. Thank you.